because you always get what you believe that you are worth. You'll never earn what you're worth, but only what you believe Believe. that you're worth. And the brain programming technique will upscale what you believe to be true. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Because when we are at corrective behavior is always facilitating what we believe. I'm Janet Ahmed, host of Hacks and Hobbies podcast and a digital presence advisor at HumbleZone. This episode is brought to you by Home Studio Mastery. I launched a consultation and course program to help podcasters and course creators to create a space in their homes that will reduce the friction of creating content and appearing their best when showing up on camera. The pandemic gave us a lot of issues, but this one is here to stay. We're now so much closer to our audience thanks to video becoming more popular and affordable. I help guide folks who want to create Hollywood-worthy studios to not only capture great content, but also build more confidence, more authority, and be more comfortable in front of the camera. If I can do it, you can too. And with my help, you can do it faster. So if you'd like to learn more, visit homestudiomastery.com and how you too can create a home studio that brings out your personality, professionalism, and possibilities. Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. We're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life. We want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. Darren is an international real estate trainer and consultant based in Australia. Specializing in property management, he delivered training to the property management side of the real estate industry since 2005 with time and task management, effective communication, and overcoming fee discounting requests. Darren has written an industry book called PM Fee Script Secrets and is currently writing another on time management. Join us as we walk through his incredible origin story, the struggles he faced, and the pivotal moments that shaped him into the successful trainer and consultant he is today. Darren, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Darren, let's take a walk through memory lane and rediscover your origin story and what inspired you to become a trainer and consultant. Now, we spoke in the green room. You mentioned that you were one of the people that would perform these duties, inspecting the real estate properties, but now you switched over. So talk us through what even inspired you to get into the real estate space. All righty. Well, I have um, just a little bit of background for everybody. Um, I'm based in Australia. Uh, a lot of people don't know a lot about Australia. They think it's a place where we've got kangaroos on our, in our front yard and koalas in our trees and, and all of that. And, and quite frankly, in the place where I live at the moment, it's right on the edge of the metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got countryside directly across the road. So yes, every now and again, when things are really um, hot there's a bit of a drought we get the kangaroos do come in the middle of the night and eat up our lawn and we can see their droppings on the lawn or yeah. the odd koala is in the tree in the area <laughs> and we cockatoos <laughs> and all of that stereotypical stuff that people think yeah. about australia uh, i happen to have but it's not the normal um, but australia is very much the landmass of uh, uh america it yeah. really is the size of america but the population a bit smaller than texas we still got the spread of land but the less people in between people, there are a lot more gaps. And so if you're thinking about the map of America, where I'm based in Australia, just think of Texas. That's mm-hmm. that I'm in the middle at the bottom. Whereas a lot of the, most of the people, the population live on the East coast of Australia and 90% of our population in Australia lives uh, in the coastal regions only because of the temperature. It gets very yeah. hot. And the hostile and in somewhat in some parts of course there's, there's so much desert so that gives you an idea and I first started I, I grew up in a place called Wyala. Wyala is one of those little towns that if you came from Wyala, people feel sorry for you and <laughs> South Australia is the state where I live and South Australia is laughed at by the rest of Australia it's a little bit like Tasmania Australians laugh if you come from Tasmania thinking that you must be an inbred or something. It's just one of those little jokes. And obviously the Tasmanians don't appreciate that sort of thing. But they say in South Australia, 
it, it's it proves that Tasmanians can swim. That's the in joke in Australia. Terrible and so, but in yeah. South Australia, I come from a little town that even the South Australians would laugh at. And so it's amazing where people that, that can, you can get, and it, it doesn't matter your background, you can get success. And so I came out of this little working class town that is a, does a lot of, it produce, known for its steel production, blue collar. And if you think of that Billy Joel song, Allentown, then it was Allentown. And so I moved to the capital of South Australia, which is Adelaide. That's where I live and still live now. And in, in 1988, had no experience. And I ended up falling into a real job, my first real job. Before then, I was simply changing tires on a car and putting oil into cars or mm. fuel into cars or trying to sell products for the Royal Guide Dogs Association over the phone or trying to sell fertilizer and just meaningless jobs like that that I probably wasn't very good at. And I fell into a job. I met a guy. It was actually, I was in a church and I met a guy who runs several real estate offices. And um, and he, these are his words. And I guess, you know, I'll be a little bit open and honest with everybody because um, I think that's good. But he said that God told him to employ me. That was his words. Yeah. And that was very clear, he said. And I had no potential, nothing. I, I should say, yes, I had potential. I had no experience. So mm -hmm. he dropped me into this role. And it was, if you've ever rented property before, or, or if you had a real estate agent managing that property, doing the inspections, collecting the rent, making sure everything's okay, organizing repairs, that was the job that I was dropped into. My first two years, I hated it. I found it so overwhelmingly difficult because I came out of a childhood where it wasn't the best situation for me. I there was a level of abuse and oh. I was very underconfident in myself. I had a very low self-esteem mm -hmm. and therefore the conflict that I faced in property management, dealing with landlords, dealing with tenants, dealing with inspections, people not wanting to pay their rent, owners getting upset because the rent wasn't paid. There's a lot of conflict. And so uh, I found the job very unpleasant, uh, but I would not quit because this was my first real job and I'm not going to quit. And so unfortunately I got retrenched from the recession. We had a recession at that time in Australia. I got retrenched and I went out into the great unknown for a little while considering what am I going to do? And the only ever real job that I've had, I don't have anymore. And I thought, well, why don't I try and get back into the industry, but not in a frontline position where I'm dealing with the tenants, dealing with the landlord, dealing with the conflict. Why don't I get a position where it's a bit of a step back, a, a support position to property managers. And I ended up getting a full-time job as a property inspector. Mm -hmm. So I was doing um, all the entry condition reports. So you can record the condition of a property when a tenant moves in, do the same when they move out. So to, to work out um, if they're going to get their security bond back and all the checkup inspections in between, we call routine mm -hmm. inspections. And all, also I got to do all the tribunal hearings. And they were difficult. And I went somewhat from the frying pan into the fire when it was conflict. <laughs> and But through that period, I was confronted with some hearings that I was losing. And the, the boss came to me, threw files at me, Darren, you're losing these hearings. You, you got no confidence. And I struggled with confidence. I really did. Because yeah. I, I would lose sleep for three weeks knowing a tribunal hearing was coming up. And I would just... Anxiety, lots of anxiety around it. Anyway, there, there, there was, honestly, I, I during that time, I said to them, this is my problem. I'm going to deal with it. Because I, I, I would shut down with fear, whether it was post-traumatic stress disorder. There were certain things you could shut me down really quickly and I'll freeze up in fear. And I just, it was a real problem, like a bowling chain on my leg every day, fear. Yeah. And one day I was actually at a restaurant with a friend, we got up, went to the salad bar, sat down, and there was no one in that restaurant that I knew. But when I got back to my seat, there was a piece of paper that someone had written a note for me. And I looked around and couldn't see anyone that I could recognize. And it was a scripture from Psalms, which said, and God will release you from all your fears. And I knew that was for me. Couldn't recognize anyone there. Yeah. And within three weeks of that, 
the most awesome thing happened. God's power came on me. It changed me within a 24 hour period of something I'd struggled with for 23 years mm. was gone. And I just had this amazing confidence just came on within a 24 hour period. And I went from using an analogy of confidence from a horse and cart to a Ferrari wow. overnight. And that was a problem because now I'm overconfident. And it took me time to fine tune it to just being a regular car on the road. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. I had to, I had, I literally had to learn to fine tune it because I was so confident. All my fear was gone. It was like I got been given the great greatest Christmas present out. Yeah. And it's and I feel so free. I had to learn to tone it down so I'm not being <laughs> overconfident and cocky. Does that make sense? So it took time to tune it in. Anyway, so because my confidence or my fear was gone, which had locked me down, that's really at that point in 1993 where my career took off. And I decided that I'm going to be the most in, in, in property management, being a difficult job, and it is a really difficult job, I'm going to be the best I can be at it. And I'm going to conquer it and I'm going to master it. And that was really my journey to where I am today as an international authority in property management. And that was the, really the real start beginning. So from there, I, I worked in a number of um, real estate offices. Mm -hmm. um, and and then, and I guess the job, I did it for many years. I was very good at it, very much in demand. Not once did my fear ever come back, for, even for a second. So now I'm a different person, total confidence. And, uh, and that fear that just locked me up was long gone, never to come back. And I... Another defining moment, and I, I just want to be honest about this. I was walking outside of an office, and this is all part of where I am now. I was walking outside of an office. So I remember the time of day. I mean, do you remember certain big events that happened? Yeah, you know, yeah. that, do you remember what you were doing when 9 11 occurred? Do you remember? Yeah, everybody remembers. Do you remember that, the moment? Yeah. Do you remember the time? Do you remember how you were feeling when you saw that, right? Yeah. This is one of those moments for me. I was walking outside of a real estate office where I was working. I was off to an early lunch. It was about 11.30 in the morning. It was a beautiful spring day in September, 1997. I remember the, even the color of the sky. It was just so clear. And I was walking down some steps out the side of the office to go and get something to eat. And God spoke to me so clearly. It was may as well have been audible. Mm -hmm. And he spoke very clearly four words. It was totally unmistakable. Sometimes... He speaks as a quiet voice. In this case, it was very loud. Mm -hmm. Teacher, trainer, coach, manager. That was the four words he spoke to me. And I was none of those things. And I realized that's what he is going to, he's calling me to be. And I just said, yeah. the best thing I could do was thank you. I accept that. I want to be all of that. Not oh no, I'm too, I'm not worthy or right. I can't do that. I can't do that. Go find someone else. A bit like Moses at the burning bush. Go find someone else. No, he wasn't. It was, thank you. You know, and because I needed to receive that immediately. And from that point, some weird things happened because I actually left the real estate industry for a couple of years. I got sick of it. And I thought if those things are going to come true, it ain't going to be with this company I'm working with right now. Right. It has to be some. Different but thing. here is here is something really interesting. I had zero computer skills. I was totally computer illiterate. Mm -hmm. And I left and I got a job in, a, in an insurance company, real uh, keying insurance policies live when people call. And I had a very extreme, very painful crash course on how to use and how to use a computer. Mm -hmm. And so when I, in two years, after two years, when I left, I was completely and totally computer literate. And that's where I, I really know that's where I was meant to be to learn those skills for the next yeah. chapter. Yeah. And so I went back into to real estate. And from there, things just grew and grew. And I had developed some skills at that time in 2000 in an office, which I now am a, a, an international authority on. And basically, I understood how I could go to 100 landlords that we were managing their properties and say, due to business running expenses have gone up due to this or that, we've had to put up your fees. And here's what they are. And so I learned what's called fee maximization, how to increase fees. And see, a lot of people in real estate think that if you do that, you'll lose clients. You'll lose them. 
but I discovered that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. And I was at, I, I substantially increased the profitability of that business and really caught the notice of the company I was working for. And that's the start of my journey being called a, um, a fee maximization expert and now an international authority on that. I've done hundreds of businesses since then. I've written a book on it and how to earn more with what you've got instead of simply going to get more business to get busier, earning more with what you've got and becoming more profitable. So from there, I began the journey and the fulfillment of those four things were now rolling out. Bang, those things were coming into being bit by bit. So I went from being a property manager in 2000 to being a senior property manager, managing other people in 2002 to then in 2003, I was elevated my manager position in those four words. I became state property manager of, of 18 offices with 28 property managers over a size of the third of Australia. So if you think the middle part of Australia, top and bottom was now my territory. Wow. And these are offices outside of the cities, the regional areas. And so now I'm managing all of these property managers with all of their day-to-day issues, making sure they pay their, make sure they chase any late rent, Mm -hmm. making sure their work's getting done, training them, recruiting them, making sure they're following policies and procedures that I'd written. And after about a year of doing that, something very significant happened and again i remember the day i remember the time i remember exactly what i was doing i was driving at a uh, in a car traveling between regional areas and it suddenly hit me i want to be a, a, a trainer and consultant i've got to move i want to be a trainer and consultant and from that point i was gone i was now for the next year i was working my exit plan I was exiting from a salaried, paid, secure job where I just got paid a salary week in, week out Mm -hmm. and completely leaving that and becoming an independent trainer and consultant, self-employed with no guarantee of any money. And that's all I wanted to do was to be a hide gun for any real estate office that needs someone to come in and train their team or teach them how to get more fees or whatever. And that year was a year of exit from a, and and I I just could not be deterred otherwise. My blinkers were on. That's all I wanted to do Mm. was to be the trainer and and a teacher. And so the fulfillment, again, though, those four words, it was just coming into being like that. And I had people saying, Darren, you can't do that. No one has ever employed. There's always well, going to be people. Here's the big, here's a big issue, right? Most real estate offices, particularly in Australia, well more than 60 to 70 percent are owned by people who are salespeople. They're realtors, they're real estate salespeople. They don't understand property management. It's so different from sales. But yet these people run the businesses and they and property management is just this thing that they throw to the side. That, that a lot of them treat it with contempt. Because it just brings the stress into the office. It brings yeah. those tenants into the office. It's a pain in the butt for them, all the problems that come with it. When activity and the adrenaline pumping sales, and we've got this problematic pro- property management, we don't understand, neither can we work at how to make quality money out of it. And so that is, in general, the sickness of the property management industry because it's in the shadow and the, and the poor cousin and the neglected cousin of sales. And so in that case, a lot of bosses tend not to want to spend any resources and training, Mm. improving. And here I am coming in as a full-time trainer and consultant. And so I had some two very key mentors in my life saying, Darren, don't do it. It's not going to work. Business owners don't care about property management that much to want to employ and spend money on someone like you. But my blinkers were on. I was not listening. And interestingly, when I first I resigned from my job, I thought I had 12 weeks worth of pay coming from that company in my holiday. And I incorrectly read my agreement that I started with them. And it was actually six weeks worth. Oh, wow. I stepped off into six weeks pay and not 12. And I visited every office across Adelaide, which is a population similar to, to Austin. It's very similar to Austin, over a million people. In fact, Adelaide is a sister city to Austin officially. And I, I visited every real estate office. I, I made sure I saw as many business owners as I could. And bit by bit, I started getting business and, and I got traction. 
very quickly. Yeah. And, my, and, the, and it took off from there. And I was very Adelaide based. And then I just decided that I'm going to go national. And then within a couple of years, I'm traveling around Australia doing what I do. And then from there, I thought, I'm going to go international. So then in 2009, I'm flying to the States and I'm, I'm presenting in Florida at conferences there. And, and really, it hasn't stopped since then. Um, it, five years ago, I, I started up a new business with a, a partner, business partners called Inspired Growth Training. So we focus on the property management side of things with growing their business, growing their fees, growing their profitability. And, and I've written two books. The first one is called PM Fee Script Secrets, which teaches people one of the, the, there's generally the three biggest problems that people, that real estate agencies have, because you can only ever train to the problems, right? Mm -hmm. What's the problem that people want to solve? And you come up with a service that solves that problem that people are willing to pay for. That's really important. If they're not willing to pay for it, you're going to go broke. So the biggest three problems are business owners don't have enough growth. So they don't, they're not growing their rent roll, which is it's called a rent roll. If you've got a hundred rental properties, it's called a rent roll. And then they're not growing and they want to get more properties on their rent roll. So we, that's the biggest problem. If you go to any business owner, it's not no use going to property managers because they don't, they don't pay the money. It's the bosses that pay the money. Their biggest problem is they're not getting enough growth. So we're number one in that space over Australia, New Zealand. And we compete with several big companies in the United States on that. So the number two is when they go to get a new business, owners say, but the other agent is cheaper. Or if you can match your management fee with the other agency down the road, because you're in real estate, your fees are negotiable, so I'm going to negotiate. But that same owner wouldn't negotiate on a Big Mac down at McDonald's or a, 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 some clothing at a cashier down at Target. And, but they will in real estate. And so all of these people in property management don't understand how to negotiate. And so I wrote a whole book on that. On, on, on how to respond to just about any objection that these owners have. And I've just finished my second book. It's my first draft, which is on time management for property management. So it's the, the first book that's ever written for the industry on time management. So they're my two passions. It's time management and fees. So Very cool. gives you a bit of a nutshell there. Man, that's a pretty big nut for sure. That's almost a... It's almost a emu. What's that ostrich egg? <laughs> Let's take a quick break and we'll get back and you'll share with the audience three hacks to take away in your space. I'm Janet Ahmed, host of Hacks and Hobbies podcast and a digital presence advisor at HumbleZone. This episode is brought to you by Home Studio Mastery. I launched a consultation and course program to help podcasters and course creators to create a space in their homes that will reduce the friction of creating content and appearing their best when showing up on camera. The pandemic gave us a lot of issues, but this one is here to stay. We're now so much closer to our audience thanks to video becoming more popular and affordable. I help guide folks who want to create Hollywood-worthy studios to not only capture great content, but also build more confidence, more authority, and be more comfortable in front of the camera. If I can do it, you can too. And with my help, you can do it faster. So if you'd like to learn more, visit homestudiomastery.com and how you too can create a home studio that brings out your personality, professionalism, and possibilities. Hey, welcome back to the episode we've been speaking with Darren Hunter. Darren, thank you so much, man. I love your story. The All of the things that you've gone through, there's a lot of signs from God. And one of the things that I've mentioned to on an episode talking on being a guest on another episode was talking about getting signs from God because they are real. They are there are things that are boiling in our heads that finally come to a conclusion because it, our subconscious is always working to get to you to a better place. I love that you shared that on the episode. Take it away, three hacks for our entrepreneurs that they can use in their business. 
All right. The, the first one is something that it's a programming technique that I've used for many years. Hmm. And to, to my benefit, I first learned this from Brian Tracy. So I believe it was in his book, The Psychology of Selling. But in any case, it's, hmm. uh, it's understanding, firstly, that our brains are supercomputers. And oh, the yes. brain is the most amazing machine on the planet, the human brain. And the great news is that we've all got one. And we've got access to one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, you know, the, the human brain has created the most complex machine on the planet, which is the space shuttle. People aren't real. It is actually the most complex machine on the planet. Mm -hmm. And there was only seven of them made. And they're, they're billions and billions of dollars each. And they just perform so many complex tasks. Yet our human brain created that, which... I'm inferring is our brain is yeah. better. Yeah. And our brain has created several supercomputers on the planet, which can create billions of calculations in a split second for what a purpose they need it for. But yet what it will take 40 seconds to do, a human brain will still take a second to do. And so again, though the super com human com supercomputers are amazing, the brain is better. And to understand that, that the brain can work for us or against us, depending on how we program it. And so we can actually get our brain serving us to do what we want it to do. And so the brain programming technique that I started using was around my fee income. So I should say my income that I was earning at the time. When I first started, when I left my secure job to become a trainer, I was earning about $6,000 a month. And that was what I believed I was worth. And for example, if I said to you, come and work for me, I'll get you to do this mm -hmm. and I'll pay you 20 grand a year. Your response will probably be, Darren, I don't get out of bed for that. What you do, what do you get out of bed for? What's that amount? Is it 80? Is it 100? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you believe you are worth. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if I believed I was worth $6,000, what if I was able to change what I believed to be true and now believe using brain programming techniques that I'm worth $8,000 a month? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I would laugh at six grand. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even blink at it. I wouldn't even get out of bed for it. Because you always get what you believe that you are worth. You'll never earn what you're worth, but only what you believe, believe. that you're worth. Yes. And the brain programming technique will upscale what you believe to be true. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Because when we are corrective behavior is always facilitating what we believe. So, for example, there was a guy that was a salesperson and he believed he was worth 80 grand a year mm -hmm. and he's selling cars and in the first few months things are very quiet and he's only and after four months he sold ten thousand dollars worth and he knows he's worth 80 grand a year now he should be getting up to forty thousand. so but he's still sitting on 10 but his lid his belief is what? 80K. 80,000. Mm. And right now, he's not anywhere near tracking to be on track for that because he believes he's worth 80. The reality is not that. So because of that, corrective behavior starts to kick in. He starts to get frantic. He starts to start doing what he's never done before, which is go to old contracts and start calling people of the past that he sold cars to in the past and stuff he normally wouldn't do because he's getting frantic because his lid is 80 grand and he's trying to move and manipulate reality to that belief lid. Does that make sense? So you yeah. got to understand is that we have a belief lid of what we believe to be true about us. And then we have corrective behavior or our actions that are always in line with that. What we believe and our actions are always in line. Does that make sense? So we need to write down my, my hack. My first hack is we need to write down every day I am statements. When I say I am proclaiming I am that, whatever it is, I am whatever. We don't say I want to be, 
I don't want to, we don't yeah. say I will be. We don't say I'd like to be. They're not commands that our supercomputer will accept in our programming technique. We have to actually say statements as if they have already occurred. Mm-hmm. Now, when we write, we got to write down these statements every day. So what I was doing was because I was earning six grand a month, I want to go to eight. And so I'd write down, I earn $8,000. I am worth $8,000. I earn $8,000. And I'd write that down every day. I am, or I earn $8,000. I'd write it down. And then within within probably a few months, I was hitting it. Because my actions will now, see, once you write that down enough, and it's a little bit like you're at high school or whatever, growing up as a kid, and you get people speak bad words over you, you hear those bad words enough, you actually believe them to be true. And that's yeah. the danger. For me, it's, it works in reverse. You write it down enough, you will eventually believe it to be true. And so it takes about 21 days of writing it down every day. And then it then suddenly a, flick, a, a switch goes off in your head. I'm worth eight grand. And you laugh at $6,000, that's that's just chicken feed. Mm-hmm. And suddenly in your mind, okay, and there's now thinking of all the things that you should be doing and what you want to be doing that's going to achieve that extra income. And so what I would do then, I would then, once I start hitting that new level of income, once I actually see it now brought into reality that it was true and it, I was doing it with my eyes shut, getting eight grand a month, now I'll move it up another 25%, move up the 10 grand and then repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah. And then I'd move it up to 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, See, gradually 35, uh, yeah. 40 grand a month. And that's, and, and so along the way, my corrective behavior is looking out for new things. I'm now I'm not going to the conference down the road. Now I'm flying to a conference in Austin. Because if I'm going to achieve those things, then I have to have different thinking. So my corrective behavior was always the one that was putting the wound in the sails. But the direction, the new path, was the new levels of belief. Nice. That by saying affirmations by putting in a new command into your computer that of what you knew to be true about yourself. But it takes 21 days for that new command to be received by the computer. And you just keep on. So I've extended that not just to my earning. I write down every day and I teach this. I am effective and efficient with my time. I am effective and efficient with my time. It doesn't matter if you're a crap, you believe you are crap because you actually believe you're crap with your time. Guess what your actions will do? That's exactly what's going to happen. It will confirm it to be true. And so your corrective behavior is always in sync with what you believe as fact about yourself. And so you change that fact, your actions will change. And so your actions just fall in line always with what you believe. So I am effective and efficient with my time. I weigh, put down your ideal weight. I earn, put down 25%. And you want to make it somewhat believable mm. you don't be stupid about it but right. and just go out and just use that i am writing down everyday technique to change what you believe to be true and your corrective behavior will then kick in and take you there i love it so that, that's hack number one hack number one create hack. the future that you want to realize By simply changing what you believe to be true i love it i love it our next hack, and then we got two more, and then uh, we've got six questions coming up as we get done with the three hacks. Cool. All righty. Now, the next one is really my strategy that I've used for many years. Really, it's my strategy I've used since day one is mm-hmm. rejecting yourself as the expert. All righty. And basically understanding that in this day and age, particularly in this day and age, more than any, that people are smashed busy and will not listen to anyone and do not have the time to read, do not have the time to do anything. And now we are in a space where um, people are rejecting out of the hundred things that are presented to them at any given moment. They're saying no to 99 of them. 
mm -hmm. uh, and just pushing them out and to understand that as an expert or as a service or as a product or anything like that, um, to get noticed in the marketplace, you've got to, number one, who is your ideal client? Who are they? Just get to know them. For me, it's a, a business owner, usually male, between 30 and 50, runs a rent roll of about 300 properties, probably has two to three staff. And that's my ideal client. And I know what pains they have. They're yeah. always worried that they're getting more loss with owners moving back into their properties and owners selling their properties and their, their growth is not exceeding the loss. So their net growth, they, they're stressing about that. They're stressing their staff effective and efficient with their time and all of those sort of things. And so they're the things that when that person, my ideal client, their head hits a pillow at night, this is the stuff that keeps them awake. And so human nature at its core is that we want peace. We don't want yes, problems. We, do. we want tranquility. We want peace in our lives. And problems and issues threaten that. And so the normal human instinct is I'm going to look for a solution to fix my problem so I can return to a place of tran to tranquility and peace mm -hmm. within myself. And that's what we all do, every problem. And, and we've got so many problems that we're dealing with, but they're put into priority. And so our subconscious, our supercomputer, is now scanning through our day, through our eyes, looking at the social media, noticing the billboards that are going by, and looking for anything that resembles a, a solution to that problem that we're losing sleep over and as our greatest issues. And if the subconscious picks something up, for example, a person is having issues and paying their credit card and the banks are calling them and hassling them, is st stressing people out. And then you suddenly see an article with a headline, six ways to stop the bank chasing you with your late credit card. Red flag, red alert, your subconscious goes, whoop, whoop, whoop. attention brings it to your conscious mind and now you're reading it. And if you then read that, and if you find a solution to your key problem in that piece of content, you then, who's the writer? You then consider the writer to be your now new go-to expert guru. And so now using the, the, the term, there's honor for, always honor for the teacher. Mm -hmm. The teacher is now elevated in that person's mind. And if a relationship where they're now reading other material and so forth so, and, and there's other solutions that are being given, that person loves that expert and we're now willing to spend money. And so that person becomes their go-to expert. When yeah. you become the go-to expert, people will seek you out. For example, in January 2020, I woke up and I decided my online marketing skills suck and I've got to learn. Within 24 hours, Russell Brunson was in my inbox teaching me stuff about online marketing. I was yes. then getting up every morning at 5.30 to watch his stuff live. Then it was teaching funnelology stuff, online marketing. I couldn't because it wasn't being recorded. I got up every morning and I dedicated myself. Within three weeks, I was on a plane to Nashville to his national conference before COVID hit. And I was reading his books. He was my new expert, guru, whatever you want to call it. I was spending money and that's how it works. You need to become the go-to expert yeah. giving value and solutions to the problems of your ideal client. Love that. And for everyone, two books, two books, Content Inc. So you, you, on Amazon or Audible Books, Content Inc. A-N-C, Content Inc. And the other book is called Utility, Y-O-U for you, Utility, Utility. All right, two books that will teach you that in a lot of depth and that will completely change things for you i love it there we go two hacks amazing hacks for us thank you so much darren i appreciate you man this was a ton of fun we got rapid fire questions coming up right now number one what is the one hobby that you wish you got into 
number one hobby I wish I got into would probably be playing the piano or um, playing the guitar. But I'm actually, I am considered autistic. And you'll find that typically people like me, our brains don't work very well mm. with playing melody and chords at the same time. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it just, it just never clicked for me and never worked for me. And I, I, I'd love to, but I just couldn't. Got it. Number two, what did you want to be when you were a child? I wanted to be growing up at high school. I had my thoughts of being a town planner. I wanted to be a town planner, but my grades weren't good enough and I never could get into university to pursue that. All right, sweet. Next up, what is your favorite movie or TV show? Oh my goodness me, so many. Right now, my favorite TV show is The Chosen. I'm really impressed with that. Really, really good. But other favorite TV shows, I'd have to say <laughs> Breaking Bad. Um, oh, yes. oh, my goodness me. All um, time. And Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul, to me, is probably just that little bit better than Breaking Bad. Yeah. Breaking Bad is amazing. Just Vince Gilligan. He's um, so much more character. There's so much more story and, and depth in there, I think, than Breaking Bad in its by itself. Yeah, yeah, correct. Wow. Look, movies far out. There's just, I guess I could, I have to go to the movies that I've watched a number of times to say these are my favorites. Yeah. So I guess favorites are Shawshank Redemption, I Star Wars trilogy, and Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, those sort of movies. There are some other standouts, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Yeah. It just, yeah, it, it, it's hard to put it down to one, that's for sure. Yeah. Nice. Love it. Next question. What movie would you choose if you, Darren, got to play a character in it? <laughs> oh, look, I can't act peanuts, but I guess off the cuff, it would have to be the passion, the character okay. in that, not the character. Sure. <laughs> See that. Or, the or the Lord of the Rings, um, mm -hmm. something like that. I wouldn't play Gollum, but some other noble character, sure. Aragorn, or I don't know. You know, yeah. that's it. That's a, there you, there go. you go. We got Breaking some... Bad, one of the villains. There you Would go. I be Heisenberg? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Gus Spring, he's scary. <laughs> yeah, he is. All right. La next question. Who is your favorite superhero? Superhero. Oh, look, Iron Man. Iron Man. Iron Man. I love the Iron Man. There's just something about Iron Man that I resonate to. I think one of the great things about Marvel, as opposed to the DC comics, is Marvel presents superheroes that are real and yes. have real problems and real yes. issues, whereas the superheroes of DC tend to be unrealistic, don't mm. have problems. Superman, did he ever do anything wrong? Did he have fear? All yeah. those things that we as people struggle with, Marvel seems to bring out and make sure that their characters are flawed. They're more human. Yeah, that's so true. Love it. All right, next and last question. If you were a board game, what would it be? If I was a board game, <laughs> probably time management. <laughs> time management? Board yeah, how game. to get be more effective and more efficient with your time. That's probably where I'd go. Oh, hey, maybe you things. can work on a board game that's all around time management. Yeah, uh, maybe. Who the hell would play it? <laughs> <laughs> People who don't have the time. <laughs> Only if I could play that one game, I'd be better at managing my time. Time management is such a boring topic to so many people. I get so excited with it. But yeah, anyway. That's awesome. All right, man. Thank you so much for this time. Where can the supervenors listening to this episode find you? Look, you can reach out to me, Darren at DarrenHunter.com. If you want to say hello on Facebook, just look me up, Darren Hunter. If you do join my Facebook profile, all I only use Facebook for business. I, I Social media is an awesome platform to promote your business. I think it's very toxic to get involved in it personally. I think it's terrible. Agreed. Yeah, but for business, it's very good. Other than that, Inspired Growth Training dot com inspired growth training dot com and and my book if you want to check out my book is just 
pay shipping, not that anyone here is probably want to get it, but here, uh, just go to stopdiscountingfees.com. I love it. Thank you so cool. much, Darren. I'll be sure to include the links into the show notes for the episode so people can get to those links quickly and don't have to rewind and wait, what, what was Jaren saying? So we'll make it a little easy for them to get to your contact. All right, man. Thank you so much again for this time. We learned a lot. PM fee secrets. PM fee scripts secrets. Uh, the PM fee uh, script secrets, correct. And my new book coming up is Master Your Time Secrets. So the secret right. thing is the, the Russell Brunson thing that yeah, he does. Yeah, you're bringing it in. Yeah. And yeah, no, there are yeah, yeah, two, two books I'm proud of. And I've got about three more on the top ones. I love it, man. Thank you so much again. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you for listening to Hacks and Hobbies. You can find additional information on the guest today on their website, hacksandhobbies.com. Please feel free to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on upcoming interviews with amazing guests.